Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Tech Uncensored. My name is Sam Hussein, and today we're talking about uh, the importance of data security, uh, otherwise known as cybersecurity. Uh, and just as a uh, just as a kind of precursor, uh, this month on January 11th, uh, the F FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, canceled or grounded all flights for that day in the U.S. Uh, and this was because uh, they had a glitch in their software critical to their flight safety. Uh, the White House press secretary, secretary came out and said, we don't believe it was a cyber attack. So the question would be, was it a cyber attack? Would they know if it was a cyber attack? And would you tell the public? <laughs> so, uh, so, but, uh, so I'm going to just quickly ask you uh, one by one. Would you tell the, was it a cyber attack, Andrew? Yes or no? And would you tell the public? Yes or no? Um, I, I don't know if it was a cyber attack. It, it seems to fit the bill of possibly something discovered in, in action. Uh, it could have been just an update, but the, this didn't, the system didn't go down during 911. It didn't go down during the power outages that we had. Um, there are frequent OS updates that didn't go down on those things. So, mm, you know, it's a questionable, uh, thing. If if it was, I would weigh what the reaction would be with the public. So I wouldn't tell the public if um, if I knew I couldn't solve it. You really, at this level, you have to come with a solution. You can't just say, oh, we're, you know, sorry, you know, planes may fall from the sky. Bye. You, you would probably not say it was a hack until you had a solution for it. Uh, you can log and identify these things. Um, we are not at all, these are not secrets, uh, secret intrusions in the middle of the night uh, we can log these things we can find these things out so so i would say they if they they probably know it is and they're not saying until they have a solution and if it's not they'll leave it at that that's my opinion anyways i don't know what it was i didn't do it anyways i maybe one of these other guys did it but i didn't do it okay mike cyber attack yes or no uh i think no so i'll go on that one but if it were to be a cyber attack then yes they should notify just maybe not when all the mayhem's happening but there's always a time and a place. Okay. Submit cyber attack, yes or no? Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Andrew's response, which is uh, unknown to me based on the information that's available. It could be, it could go in either direction. Um, as far as the reporting piece goes, I think, uh, you know, two parts to it disclosure to key stakeholders versus disclosure to public versus disclosure to law enforcement agencies and compliance authorities. So I think just recognizing that our responsibility to each one of those groups is unique. I think there is responsibility to report to some of those groups. Perhaps, you know, we need more information before we, uh, before we report to others and disclose to folks like the public. Chris? Uh, yes or no? I, I, I believe, no. Um, and, you know, just they, they said there was an engineering error that they uploaded the, the, the wrong file, but ultimately it points to, you know, it, it could have been uh, just by the fact that they accidentally uploaded a, a file to the system meant they didn't have the proper checks and balances. So I think, you know, it points to a, a potential cybersecurity issue. Um, the fact that even if somebody stole the engineer's credentials, you know, they could have gone in and done the same thing uh, or done something worse. So I think it points to a cybersecurity risk, but not necessarily there was a cyber attack. Okay, thanks. On this same day, hackers posted, this is just what hackers posted, 120,000 records were stolen from the San Francisco Bay Area Transit Systems Police Department. Eight major Danish banks' websites, including the Central Bank, were taken down. Several military and government agencies were broken into in Southeast Asian and European countries. And the best part is that the computing cloud software of Microsoft and Salesforce were hijacked and hackers made off with millions of dollars worth of untraceable cryptocurrency. That was just one day, and that was just what was posted. A think tank out of Washington, D.C. said 95% of companies are hacked. The other 5% just don't know they were hacked. So with that, I want to thank my panel here today. I have Sumit Bhatia a Director of Innovation and Policy at Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst. I have Chris Byrne, Director of Platform Security at, at NXM Labs. 
I have Andrew Apollo, CEO of NXM Labs, a cybersecurity software company. And I have Michael Castro, CEO of Risk Averse Cybersecurity. He is also the Chief Information Security Officer there. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us today. So first, let's uh, let's go on to uh, talk about uh, what's happening in the world today. I mean, this is just w one area that's attacked, I think, even on an individual level. I think we're ha hacked every 30 seconds, are we not? In the in the world, there, there's, someone's getting hacked every 30 seconds. So I guess if, if you were hacked on a much larger level, at an organizational level like the FAA, if it was a hack, uh, you, Mike, you said you would tell, tell the public that we were hacked. Oh, I would, but I think like anything, and as I think our esteemed colleagues here have said, it, there's a lot of ifs attached to that. So first off, of course, is the reality of whether or not hacks are and whether one is truly confident and certain that it is a it, that you know it is a breach or a hack sometimes it's very hard to determine that it's not stuff that can be necessarily sorted in the first 24 hours let alone maybe even the first 24 days um but nonetheless if you know there is the point that uh that that is identified and yeah i mean there there is a assume it said there's there are many reasons why organizations have to disclose about a breach but oftentimes, you know, we're not necessarily seeing it. You know, here in Canada, just a few months ago, Sobeys had a disruption, we'll call it, in their IT. Uh, they never actually came out and fully disclosed for weeks and weeks that they had a cyber breach. It was only at the very end when they said, oh, yeah, that's what happened. We cleaned it up. It cost us some money and on we go. So, you know, they chose the path of not disclosing to their customers, uh, where we've looked at others here in Ontario with... Um, you know, the Hospital for Sick Children, we've looked at LCBO here in Ontario. Both were very upfront, both right away saying, we've been breached, we're letting you know, we're dealing with it. And, you know, a lot can be said, I think, in terms of, of that level of communication. In fact, it cost Sobeys $25 million for that hack. $25 million After insurance. So, so, in fact, cyber hacking is the third largest global economy generating 10.5 trillion, <laughs> you know, it's crazy. The US, the only larger economies are the US and uh, China. So uh, what, what are the key vulnerability points? Let's talk about businesses. What is it that we have to do to secure ourselves from all these hacks? So let me start with Andrew. Oh, wow. So uh, I do most of the selling. So, so Chris, uh, Chris builds the platform and I try to sell it, right? So I, I come back and I, I say, Chris, what's this? What's this green button for? I don't, they don't, you know, our customers don't get it. So there's a lot of friction points um, right now with small companies, large companies. Um, the problem with, with, with security is that when we built these platforms, when we, we were taking, you know, our computer science classes in 1980s or whatever, and we were learning a program, we never thought there would be malicious people trying to, find holes in the things we were doing. And we were just making things functional. Like we were making things that collected data properly and we stored the data and we showed the data nicely in HTML forms and stuff. And then we didn't realize people were stealing this data from us. Uh, and the reason why people steal data in the first place is because there's value. I mean, people, people, um, even people who can't sort of, you know, turn that stolen data into money can still package it up and sell it on the dark board saying, listen, I've got logins to, you know, this company's loyalty program and has credit cards and home addresses and I can't do anything with it, but I'll sell, you know, this, this packet for a certain amount of money and people will, will, will pay for it. I think the, I think Michael can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think sick kids was uh, a hacker for hire thing where they use software from another company to hack sick kids. Right. It wasn't even their own software. It's just they, they, there's a, they make money on this, right? So one of the key things here is that as a, as a company, you may think your data is not of any value because it's like it's weather data from yesterday or it's like tire pressure data or something. But all this data has other elements to it that when taking an aggregate of all the data that's been stolen, if I knew you know people were in a certain location at a certain time from one data set, then I had what their car was doing and stuff like that. I could build up a whole narrative and that would have value for me. So the more data that's out there, the more leak we are all, all are in our terms of our data, 
the more value all the data has in terms of being aggregated and used. And we can find lots of things. Um, and so there's a market here, like you were saying, Sam, it's a big, gigantic market. The key is that people find the three friction points anyways that we get when we sell our solutions uh, is that first one is technology. So people see these, these things, they grew up, you know, building it a certain way and they, they see the cost of putting in a new system and they, they can't do it. I mean, it's too expensive for them in terms of their tech, technological investment. Uh, after that, there's two more that are almost never looked at, which is like the human impact. Like you have to train people to use these systems in a different way. Uh, and then there's the policy impact. You have to make rules. You have to say, you know, you know, our passwords will be changing every three months or every every month, or we're going to change change to a PKI system and use VPN or whatever. So there are these impacts that people see as just costs, right? And they're willing to lose their data if they're as long as they can still operate, they're okay with losing the data. Um, but that's changing. I mean, the the European Union is coming out with a new um, Cyber Resilience Act, which basically takes IoT off the market if it's it's if it's uh, empty and full of holes and stuff. Um, the U.S. has a bunch of uh, executive directives for security. Uh, states are bringing things in now, so I think the, the legal system is realizing like we cannot depend on any of these networks because they're so they're so full of holes, and they're forcing us to to think about this. And I think as a small company, you should think about security first when you. Uh, when you look at this, I know I'm, I'm doing a roundabout answer before you, but, but there's a lot of friction points. And I think the key is you've got to commit to improving something like you got to commit to either changing your passwords often or hashing passwords or, or dividing your data sets in different places or making sure that, you know, the places where you host your data are secure, whatever you need to, you need to bump it up. You need to bump your game up a bit. Um, we, we're, we're bad everywhere. Even our company, we, we do audits, probably less regular than we should. And we, we find things, Oh, wow. Like we just gave that guy access to all this stuff and we don't even know who he is. And um, it happens all the time. And so I'm not saying it's, we need to be critical, uh, but just going back to the vulnerability discussion too, like part of announcing your vulnerabilities is if you have partners, you really need to tell them that, Hey, you know, all of our, you know, all the data we share and we have these NDAs and stuff about sharing data. I think that's the data has been stolen. Like uh, you need to tell your partners and, and being a good, Cyber citizen is one of the important things of, of making cybersecurity more infused into everything we do. And being punished for these things is probably the wrong thing to do at this time. I think we should do, we should be open about fixing things and being honest about our weaknesses. And um, so in a roundabout way, I think that's where where people should consider that that you know we don't know a lot in, in general as a, as a economy about this yet. Uh, even though there's a lot of evidence of what's happening, uh, we just need to start stepping up and and fixing things in our in our in our own businesses about our data, understanding of the value of it, doing audits. I'm certain you know our whole whole panel here is welcome to uh, receive some emails or some questions afterwards to help uh, guide you in terms of audits and things like that. I think uh, the key is we're just not we're we're outmatched. Like we really are outmatched. Like a a clever malicious uh, hacker can really take away a lot of our future hopes of having a paid off home or a nice car or send their kids to university uh, just by stealing some of the stuff that we worked hard to get. So we should consider that as a, something we want to protect with our uh, really good cyber policies. Mike. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree with what Andrew says. I think we, we, we live in a world where vulnerabilities abound. Um, the key to, so many of them is knowing that they exist or that a threat exists. I'm very much a key um, believer in proactive security over reactive security wherever possible and really putting ourselves in a position. But but the world, it, the world's a vulnerable place. I've been in cybersecurity for almost 25 years, and I can tell you the, the path and the direction, the veracity of the, the attacks that I see today are nothing in comparison to what I saw when I first entered into this field. I mean, I was living in a world where the worst things were kitty scripters defacing websites, homepages, and, you know, having uh, anti or having viruses that would cause weird things to happen on your computer screen. 
I mean, we've come a long, long way from that, uh, all in a world of monetization and the threats. And, and that is a world we're living in. It's only going to get worse. Uh, and I think not enough organizations are ready to face that reality that everybody is a victim or a potential victim. I mean, to that note, uh, isn't it better now to be proactive and put in some type of security measure rather than say, oh, no, 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 this cost is too much for us. We'll just, whatever happens, happens. And then end up finding out that those costs are much higher, even from lawsuits when your data is taken, right? Sumit, your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely, Sam. I think, um, uh, you know, one of the things we always uh, say businesses have to first recognize is that cyber risk is a business risk. It's not just a technology risk. It's an operational risk. It's a reputational risk. It's a financial risk, right? When businesses start to think about cyber risk with that lens in mind, the measures that they take right from the beginning in embedding it within the culture of the organization starts to shift. And I think that's what we need. And that's what uh, you know a lot of our fellow panelists are saying is, you know, we need a cultural shift in how people are thinking about and businesses are thinking about cybersecurity. And as Andrew pointed out, you know, how does that change the culture when it comes to all three things, people, process, and technology, right? We've got to embed that in all of these key pieces. You know, I, I will add another layer that there is now compliance uh, requirements that are starting to pop up. Uh, in Canada in particular, we are seeing some really interesting advancements happen. We Earlier in uh, 2022, we saw, um, you know, Bill C-26, which introduced a mandatory breach reporting uh, requirement in Canada, especially on organizations designated as vital services or vital system. And when we think about that, that includes critical infrastructure, you know, banks, tele uh, telcos, transportation services. So if the, the whole incident around, F, uh, you know, the Federal Aviation Administration falls under that category, then they would have had a mandatory and do have a mandatory reporting requirement associated with them. Uh, I think the, you know, as, as panelists have pointed out, businesses are just starting to recognize that as they go through the process of digital transformation, and we know that the pandemic has uh, shifted the pace uh, on digital transformation, as we're embedding new technologies, the challenge isn't just our technology secure, it's our, is our infrastructure secure? The people accessing those technologies, do they understand how to, you know, how, what their role is? Do we understand the roles and responsibilities between us as the client and our providers like cloud providers. Uh, and so there's a lot of onboarding education that needs to happen around this for businesses to really catch on. Um, you know, we know that large organizations, large corporations, enterprises have a better understanding and it's primarily a function of resources. Uh, small, medium businesses sort of fall behind because their dependency on external resources is quite high. But we are starting to educate them that for doing baseline you know, cybersecurity work in your organization, you can actually have your frontline people, you can have a culture of cybersecurity where if you're following best practices, then you can secure yourself up to a certain point and then rely on the expertise of other organizations. There has to be that symbiotic relationship between service provider and organization. So, you know, just sort of my perspective is that uh, we really need a cultural shift in this ecosystem and education has to be a central part of it. Uh, talent has to be a key part of that discussion. And then ensuring that companies understand that people process technology and then that fourth layer, which is compliance and regulatory. And when we piece it all together, they can start thinking about how cyber risk becomes a business risk for them. All right, so um, I was looking at a, um, an image of a, you know, a car. I mean, it doesn't have to be, a, a, maybe a more recent a model where there are so many areas where you can hack that car. So uh, I'm going to ask you, Chris, uh, if I was a hacker, what is a hacker doing? How is he? Tell me the what is he, he's getting on his computer and doing what to hack that car? Uh, well, yeah. any anything and everything. Um, I mean, at the most most basic level, a hacker is someone trying to gain access to something they shouldn't, you know, whether that's data systems network. So they're they're going to be looking at every hole. Um, and so these people are generally, you know, jack of all trades. They know computer science, they know networking, they, and they have to, to be able to, uh, 
you know, kind of try and find your the the hole that's uh, in, in your system. Um, now, really, there's actually two types of attackers. There's whether it's funded, so that's something from you know governments or crime organizations, but also unfunded, some nefarious person, you know, trying to cause trouble or or maybe make a, a quick buck. Uh, so you know, generally, the unfunded attacker does not have a lot of these resources, and generally, you know, they're looking for low hanging fruit. You know, default passwords or unencrypted channels. Uh, so they'll be using scanning tools to quickly cycle through your system. So a lot of the best practices that we're talking about uh, really protect you from that type of attacker. You know, even just second factor authentication, uh, stronger passwords, make sure you use encrypted channels when you're communicating between your different endpoints. But the funded attacker, you know, is, is growing, you know, in terms of uh, you're seeing all these ransomware attacks, uh, you know, uh, cyber warfare is, is really becoming uh, a, a relevant piece to, to consider. Uh, and so these funded attackers are extremely persistent and will do a deep search of any exploitable vulnerabilities. So you really got to be sure of, you know, implementing a full security solution. And this includes securing systems all the way down to the employees themselves. Like we mentioned, you know, training and, and making sure using second factor authentication on, on absolutely, you know, everything in terms of, um, you know, email access. And so you gotta, you gotta uh, hold up every uh, kind of um, single point. And, you know, when we start looking at, let's say the internet of things, you know, it's really shown how much we're lacking in this area uh, because especially for the internet of things, it's, it's really a major problem because there's so many different types of platforms. There's embedded devices, there's PCs, there's mobile devices, there's clouds, routers, and as you mentioned, now there's cars. Um, so, you know, everything is getting connected from your refrigerator and it can be used to access other devices that maybe you're not even thinking about. So, you know, to solve this issue, it really makes it very difficult and costly to you know, implement sufficient security everywhere. And I feel in the market right now, we're kind of in this limbo phase where, uh, you know, nobody wants to budget for cybersecurity. They don't want to add to their expenses because that increases the the cost they can sell their uh, product. And so, if they do that, they increase their cost, then they lose the competitive advantage to you know their their competitors. Um, and so, what really means, and we've already talked about this, is is this is where compliance comes into play, where the governments come in and say, you know, everybody needs to implement a certain standard of cybersecurity to really level the playing field. Um, and Sorry, guys, I don't know what we had there. I think we had a, maybe we had a cyber secure attack there as well. <laughs> so all of a sudden, <laughs> we went off the air. Are you back? Hang on, Chris. What do you think? Was that a cyber secure attack? Where, who am I missing? Uh, that was that was my internet. <laughs> Your internet? Okay, okay. Uh, so I, where did I leave off? <laughs> yeah, so you were talking about uh, how many... Uh, Oh yeah, so what we were saying is that a lot of companies are not taking a proactive approach to this. Is that me or, okay, so that wasn't me. <laughs> so we, we know there's folks listening beyond beyond us, so, so who knows? Yeah, okay. Um, so maybe Maybe I'll continue what I was talking about before I left. Um, so it's kind of the advent of the the Internet of Things has really shown us how we're we're lacking in a lot of these areas because you know a major problem. Uh, loud, Sam, you got a really loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. So the Internet of Things has really shown us kind of how much we're lacking in a lot of these areas because you look at. Internet of Things specifically, and you have so many different platforms. You have embedded devices, you have PCs, you have mobile devices, clouds, routers, and now even cars, as, as we brought up earlier, and everything is getting connected. And it's very difficult and costly to implement sufficient security across all of these areas. And so hackers are, are familiar with all of these areas, and, and they're just looking for, for one hole, hole to get through. So uh, I think really what we're 
we're in a kind of a limbo phase where um, you know companies don't want to budget for security. And that's actually what we're really talking about is all companies start to need to budget for security um, because the, the problem is that, you know, especially I think in the United States and in Canada, is that adding that extra expense really means you have to, you know, raise your the price of your product and then you lose that competitive advantage. Uh, and so this is where governments come in and trying to institute uh, compliance and regulation such that they level the playing field. So everybody's implementing proper security. So no longer your fridge can, you know, hack your router or hack your PC. Everything has this, you know, base level of security. And I think that's that's a really important part, which you're seeing in the EU with uh, when Andrew brought up the Cyber Resilience Act, um, you're, you're, you're seeing this leveling of the playing field. Um, but specifically, that also means it's very difficult for, for startups. So I think, you know, you definitely put in an employee best practices, response mechanism to cyber attacks. Uh, but you know, standing up your own cybersecurity team is just too expensive uh, for especially a startup to do. And so I think uh, what you really need to see, and I think you're starting to see that, is, you know, usage of security as a service um, or, or security consulting to kind of get other people that have a lot of experience in this area uh, to reduce your costs and, and likelihood of an attack. Um, or, or even you're starting to see, especially in the embedded space, you know, the ability to choose a product that has built-in security and compliance, you know, with your existing cybersecurity standards. And so this is, you know, obviously I'm speaking from NXM in the in the IoT space, but uh, this means, you know, you, you have to design embedded applications, mobile cloud applications, and they all have their own security to deal with. And so leveraging these these companies that offer security as a service or consulting services, you know, can reduce your risk and and ultimately the cost because because otherwise you have to hire an engineering team and start putting in all of those uh, security um, um, protocols. code and protocols, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a, a plethora of things. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it ultimately it saves you money at the end of the day, which I think you know all of our panelists have have said at the end. So yeah. I mean, do you is the tide changing from? Uh, from taking a reactive approach to now going to a proactive cyber secure approach. I mean, this, this, uh, cyber security hackers, I mean, they, they, they're, it's a, it's a illegitimate organized business. If, if it was a legitimate business, I think we'd all be investors because up until 2022, it was growing at 15% per annum. And in 2022, it grew at 38%. Yeah. I mean, what a great return, right? But so, are we, are we, do you see the tide turning where we're going to go from rather than going from a reactive to a proactive and let's now spend the money up front because it's going to cost us a lot more if we don't? Mike, what do you think? Uh, well, there's definitely a, a cost advantage to kind of do things in advance. Because um, we, I mean, we think about it, it's, you know, taking a, a proactive approach. Has, has a cost attached to it. There's no doubt about it, right? It, it's the cost of, of being prepared no matter at what level. But now the cost of responding to something, the cost of dealing with an incident, the cost of potentially dealing with malware, the cost of recovery, forensics, uh, possible legal issues and lawsuits, um, PR, et cetera, et cetera, is getting to be quite expensive. So, you know, being proactive means there's a, you know, a opportunity to reduce likelihood and an opportunity to reduce impact. And I think those are the key things. We can never say that being proactive is going to protect you, uh, but it definitely can lessen the likelihood if, if you do the right things and you take the right steps. So I always look at it as, you know, money well invested. It's no different than, you know, other things that we do to prepare ourselves, whether it be, you know, doing tune-ups on your car or maintenance try to keep your car from breaking, right? We, we change the oil, we change the air filters and the like, and we spend hundreds of dollars a year doing that with the hope that, you know, our engine's not going to blow and we're going to end up with a $6,000 bill. So there's, there's a need for organizations to look at it that way. There's a need for them to not just put money into, into the fund for a rainy day and to actually, you know, start to invest in themselves and, and be prepared. If I could add something, I, I think Michael, you hit it right on the on the head there. It's like, like um, 
it's driving and you see the gas meter go to the E and you know you need to get gas. Um, I, by the way, I'm not electric yet, so that's, I'm, I'm in the old economy. Um, so you know you you know there's you you're averting something terrible stopping on a road somewhere with no gas and i think what security is missing is this kind of like a you know a campfire warning thing when you enter a provincial park or a campsite or a weather warning that it's going to be rainy or snowy or thunderstorms what we need to do is we could we have to have the security establishment has to have this little gauge that says attacks are high you know, call your security expert, get your audits done, make sure your passwords are changed. We need, as a group ourselves, we need to come with this, this, this fuel gauge that says, "Hey, you're low, and you got to get your your rear end in gear because you're going to be attacked or you're being attacked right now." I think that I think just triggering what you said, Michael, is really exactly what we haven't done for the marketplace, but I think we should do it. I, I think maybe uh, Sumit might want to comment on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just you're going to get the last word here. Oh, uh, perfect. I'll be very quick. I just can't uh, help myself but go with the car analogy right now. You know, I think uh, cybersecurity right now is being treated like uh, winter tires and we need it to be treated like the wheel itself, right? Uh, it, it, it will change the way your company operates versus, oh, this is a nice to have and I'll decide whether or not I can afford it this particular winter. So I'll just leave it at that. Cybersecurity for me is an essential wheel of the company, and we need to start getting businesses to start thinking in that direction. Okay, on that note, and and on the on on uh, on, a, on a, a little bit more of a further note is that maybe we were we were cyber attacked here on this podcast. I don't know, right? I mean, how do we would we know if we were attacked? How would we do the audit? Chris, quickly, how do we know? <laughs> uh, there's, we, 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 right now, no, we don't know. Um, and it takes all, like, as Mike mentioned earlier, you know, to take, take 24 hours, 24 days, it, it really depends on the attack. And that's ultimately the problem. It just, it can be anything. Um, and that what's, that's what makes it difficult. Okay. Well, on that note, thank you very much, Armin, Sumit, Andrew, Mike, Chris, thanks for taking your valuable time and sharing your thoughts on our podcast today. All right. Thanks Have a great course. rest of the week. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. And that's it from us at Tech Uncensored. Uh, don't forget, we have uh, two programs that we're uh, open for registration on. That, that's our incubator program, which is focused on marketing and sales, and our investor readiness program, which is focused on companies that are looking to raise capital. Go to uh, altitudeaccelerator.ca and register there. And as usual, if you have any thoughts or comments on topics you would like us to cover, uh, email us at communications at altitudeaccelerator.ca. Have a great week.